Well, it's 10.02, so I'm thinking that we should get started, and of course the recording will be available for everybody after. So I want to start off by just saying welcome. Welcome to Unleashed. This is a weekly one-hour series featuring top thought leaders discussing tools and strategies to unleash your potential, and also the potential of the people around you, your teams, and ultimately your business and the organization that you're part of. Now, especially during a crisis, we need to rely on experts. We have to rely on research, and that is what this show is all about. I've been tweeting out the last couple of days that uh, we're, we're really aiming to bring world-renowned thought leaders and experts right into your own homes uh, every Thursday at 10 o'clock in the morning mountain time. I'm your host, Jeff Tetz. I'm the CEO of a company called Results, and we help companies build teams that perform and execute at an insanely high level. And you can imagine how challenging that is under recurrent circumstances. And I'm really excited about today's show. But before I get to that, I need to say thank you. And I want to say thank you to all of you who are joining us. Thank you to our community who are showing up and helping spread the word. We really couldn't do this show without you. And this is something that we want to grow and build. And we know for us to do that, first of all, the show's got to be really, really helpful to you. And it's, we're going to have to rely on word of mouth and social media and emails going back and forth. And not only bringing yourself to these shows, but telling your team and your people and all of your colleagues in, in the communities that you're from to come and spend an hour with us as well. We will be answering questions today. And make sure that the questions that you want to ask of Amber are in the Q&A box. So there's, there's two chat boxes. There's the chat one, and then there's the Q&A. Make sure the questions go into the Q&A box, okay, which is different. And if you don't get a chance to discuss one of your questions on live, uh, on the air live with us today, you can send those by email to info at unleashedresults.com and we'll get back to you promptly over email. Okay? Uh, and you may uh, see our producer, Andrea Kenna, from time to time posting comments in the chat box or in the Q&A as she pulls the strings for us marvelously uh, behind the scenes and makes this whole thing come together. We also have a number of special offers for you at the end of the show. So be sure to hang on to hear more about those at the very end. And also about next week's guest, Allison Fergale, who's a workplace researcher from University of North Carolina. All right, enough with that. Let's get on with the show. So today we are discussing relentless adaptation. My co-host today is my dear colleague, Christy Benoit. She's a business execution specialist with results. She provides coaching, training, and advisory to senior leaders and their teams as they strive to build successful and sustainable companies. She has over 15 years of experience in leadership development, and she also has uh, another sort of claim to fame where she was the visionary and the developer behind one of the world's northernmost net zero energy commercial buildings, the Mosaic Center, in the southern part of Edmonton, Alberta. So welcome, Christy. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Yeah, glad to have you here. And our featured guest today is the effervescent Amber MacArthur, better known as Amber Mac. Amber started her career in San Francisco and Boston, one of my favorite cities, during the dot com boom, spending four years in the technology startup trenches. She left the startup world to join Microsoft to build one of the first female focused lifestyle portals. In 2006, she started her own digital agency where her first client was none other than world-renowned business coach, Tony Robbins, and I want to talk more about that. And now it includes Microsoft, Google, GE, PayPal, Nintendo, Canada Goose, and Fast Company, and many more leading organizations. She's also written two best-selling books, and most recently, she started co-hosting a new podcast series presented by Accenture called Marketing Disrupted. It is a phenomenal podcast have a chance to listen to that please do he's also moderated sessions with justin trudeau former fbi director james comey business coach tony robbins uh, famed astronaut uh, chris hadfield and many other notable leaders he's a regular host and expert for fast company cnn bloomberg cbs bnn ctv she was on the maryland dennis show yesterday morning and she's on that show regularly and that is a great show he's also on sirius uh, xm radio plus in 2018, she was named one of DMZ's 30 inspirational women, making a difference in tech. And in 2019, her podcast, The AI Effect, won Best Technology Series. That is an amazing, amazing resume, Amber. 
We're so glad to, uh, to have you here. Uh, so off we go. But before we dive into Relentless Adaptation, I would love it if you would talk a little bit about the time that you spent with Tony Robbins. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me here today. I'm watching in the chat. Hello to Rick and Al and Jeff and Steven and uh, everybody who is here watching this live or watching it after the, uh, the fact. Um, it just shows what a massive community you have, Jeff, in terms of the reach and so many people who have signed on to learn. So we are going to get into talking about relentless adaptation and a framework that I've put together just for this webinar to talk about how to survive during COVID-19. But I thought I'd start with a, a lighter story about uh, one of my first experiences working with Tony Robbins. And, and this dates way back to uh, around 2006. And what was happening at the time is I was working at City TV as one of their first technology reporters. And I got an email from someone who said, hey, uh, I just want you to know that I, I'm working with Tony, Tony Robbins. You might know him. We're really interested in talking to you because we know that you know a lot about social media and Tony is interested in the space. And uh, the good news is that uh, Tony's coming to Toronto and he would like to meet with you. Now, uh, I have to admit at the time, I didn't really know a lot about Tony Robbins. And so uh, I did more searching and then I just became more terrified by the second <laughs> that uh, he wanted to meet with me. And uh, it was quite overwhelming at the time. But of course, like anyone who uh, uh, is uh, in business and wants to be able to survive uh, during all times, I'm one of those people who usually says yes. And I say yes before I figure out anything else. And so uh, I said yes. And then we made a plan where Tony was coming to Toronto. Now here's the catch. <laughs> he was coming to Toronto. And the only time that he had to talk was while he was actually flying after an event from Toronto to London, Ontario on his private jet. So that was our meeting time. It was the, you know, hour and a half, you know, before we took off to London, Ontario and uh, landed in London, Ontario from Toronto. So of course the day is getting uh, stranger by the second. Uh, first of all, let's just remember that I was actually supposed to be at work at the time <laughs> reporting on the news. And uh, instead I had made this appointment to talk to him. So uh, here's another added layer to the story. I have never been a good flyer, so I'm quite a nervous flyer. So uh, uh, the thought of flying in a small plane terrified me. So I go, I, I meet up with Tony and his team, and then we go to the uh, private uh, airport in Toronto. Uh, we get onto his plane. As soon as we walked up, I said, oh, you know, oh, this is a, a really nice plane. And he kind of chuckled like, yeah, this is a Gulfstream and <laughs> worth millions and millions of dollars. Uh, so uh, we get onto the plane. And I'm terrified. It's, it's quite stormy. And uh, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm going to crash on this flight. And then people are going to ask me what the heck I was doing on this flight with Tony Robbins, who I never met before today. And this is going to be just completely the, the worst case scenario. And uh, we're on the plane and, and we're chatting about social media, about working together and uh, how some of the people I worked with outside of the TV station could help his team. Uh, having a great conversation. But of course, you know, I'm kind of terrified, but I'm playing it cool. Like, this is Tony Robbins. I've got to suck it up and, and, you know, be as confident as possible. So anyway, we land in London, Ontario, and uh, we get off the plane and, and I turn to him and I say, you know, I have to apologize. I really wasn't myself on that flight. Uh, I'm a, a little bit afraid of flying. And he looks at me and he goes, no shit. <laughs> he goes, you were gripping the armrest and sweating the whole time, which is why I kept talking to you to make sure you're okay. And so that is my first lesson from my first meeting with Tony Robbins, which is, uh, you know, just to embrace authenticity and be honest, because there's a lot of people out there who, of course, uh, appreciate that. And this really taught me in, in that moment uh, that I should have just come out and told him exactly how I was feeling instead of trying to hide it. So uh, that was a, a good experience. I had ex explained to him that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I felt better that we were on the ground. Um, and he said, well, don't worry, we have a plane to take you back to Toronto. And I thought, okay, this is great. Like, they're going to fly me in this nice jet back to Toronto. I'll be okay. But I didn't realize that his jet was actually going somewhere else with him after the event. And they had hired a little, uh, a little prop plane, a four-seater, <laughs> to take me back to Toronto. And uh, the woman flying the plane was in training, and I was in the back and couldn't hear anything. So. I won't go into the detail, but let me just say that uh, the, the jet was looking pretty good after that. So 
that was my first time meeting him. And uh, again, uh, I think the lesson there really is uh, just to be honest, especially in times like this. And then the, the, the second uh, experience I had with him, which taught me a lot, um, and the lesson here was to um, really exceed expectations. So after working with him for a few months and I had quit the TV station, we became contractors of his company. We traveled a bit with his team and uh, we were helping them with social media video. And I had asked him because I was writing my first book on uh, social media. And I asked him, I said, would you do a testimonial for me? Just a, you know, a quick two sentence that I can use in the book. Great testimonial from Tony Robbins. And he's like, yeah, no problem. So about four or five days later, I don't get a testimonial from him. I get an almost two minute video of him sitting at his desk. And I looked up the video just to, to quote it, where he says, uh, talking about me and my social media experience. And he says, uh, when I first met Amber, I was blown away by the level of passion she has for the internet and how she can help people all over the world. Um, I highly recommend this woman for anything that you're doing in social media. She's one of the best in the world. I mean, this went on for two minutes, just this amazing glowing reference. And he sent it to me and I was in shock because here was one of the busiest people I had ever met in my life. And all of a sudden, not only did he give me a testimonial, but it was a video testimonial that I used for probably two or three years that helped me get speaking events, helped me launch my book. And it just goes to show you that the people who are tremendously successful in life are these people who exceed expectations. And I learned so much from him thinking at the time I was nobody, just this, you know, young woman from Canada who was trying to figure out her way around the internet. Uh, and he could have just written me two lines. And instead he went and took the extra effort to do this. And he never even mentioned uh, that horrible flight that day. So <laughs> I have a ton of respect for him. And over the years have definitely learned a lot from him. Well, that's a remarkable story, Amber. And I have to say that uh, you're the embodiment of, uh, of being a giver and paying it forward. We've known you for less than a year, and the time that you have given to us and our team, I, I still uh, sometimes wonder how you find the time just for your own work, let alone to help others, because I'm sure we're on we're a list of, of 100 people that you're helping on a daily basis, so we can't thank you enough. Absolutely. You know, it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm always happy to help out and learn and try new things. And uh, I think during this time, especially, uh, I feel as though this is the time to say yes to things, even if you don't have all of the answers as far as how to make things work. So uh, it's all about experimentation right now and having this appetite for trying new things that we've talked for years about wanting to do it. And now we have this great opportunity to do them. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Christy, did you have anything to add before we dive into Relentless Adaptation? No, I don't think so. Let's get at it. Okay, sounds good. Well, it goes without saying right now that uh, five weeks ago in Canada, our worlds were turned upside down uh, when the COVID pandemic hit. And uh, no one has gone unaffected. Everybody has been impacted severely. And we're, we're finding that there's so many different stories emerging where some companies have been able to pivot seemingly overnight and launch new businesses and and. Uh, Canadian Shield being one of them that you interviewed uh, last week, Amber, that is scaling up a 300-person business in three weeks, and it's amazing. Other companies are sort of experimenting and trying to see what will work, and then other companies are completely paralyzed for good reason, figuring out how to adapt, how to adjust, whether they even should. And, and so there are so many questions. There are no right or wrong answers, but this is such an important topic. And I, uh, I'm so glad that we can explore it here today. So Amber, I know you've been doing a lot of work in this area. Why don't you share with us some of your thoughts, ideas, and a framework that you have developed for relentless adaptation? Yeah, so uh, Jeff, thanks so much. And um, you're exactly right. I think all of us are having to learn during this process. And the one thing I really wanted to do in terms of delivering value today is to not just talk about my experience over the past few weeks as a small business owner, but uh, I took some time over the past couple of days and I wanted to figure out uh, just on paper, the framework that we have been using at Amber Mac Media, my business to be able to adapt during these times. And, and I will say, uh, you know, even though I think from uh, the outside looking in, um, I'm quite an optimistic and happy person. So everything you see seems really great. Uh, just remember that I also work in the event space. <laughs> 
<laughs> like many of you um, who are hosting this webinar. And that means I've had dozens and dozens of keynotes that have been postponed or, or moved to uh, 2021. So at Amber Mac Media, we've really had to learn how to adapt and tap into those other revenue streams uh, that we have at our fingertips. And uh, we're a small business. So just to give you some background, there are fewer than five employees, but we work with up to 10 different regular contractors. So that's how our business is set up. Uh, our revenue per year is in the seven figures, quite a healthy business. Um, and we've been in operation for just over five years. So that's a little background to understand the business. So I know there are a lot of businesses out there who you know, have a similar makeup. We know that in Canada, uh, small business owners actually employ seven out of 10 Canadian workers. So this is a big part of our economy and an important part of our economy as well. More than 1 million small businesses in Canada today. And many of them, of course, uh, face these new realities where they are going to be affected by everything that's happening right now. Um, and, and, and some businesses just aren't going to make it through this. I don't want to be naive about that. So I mentioned that, but uh, there's a good chunk of businesses that I believe are able to really uh, pivot and survive throughout this process. But it, it means really uh, sink, sinking in your feet and uh, doing things differently. And so I wanted to show this framework that I hope is useful for many of the people who are here today. Um, and this is a five-step framework that uh, I've worked on just for this webinar to talk about uh, not only my own experience as a small business owner, but over the years speaking to many businesses of what I believe is necessary right now, uh, five steps to really make sure that your business survives during these times. And I do want to say that uh, this speaking event for me <laughs> during this webinar is uh, uh, one that is, is filled with practical advice. So a lot of these things that I've put in here are practical steps. Um, so I want to just look at first at the very bottom of this framework. And what I have along the bottom is to prioritize health. And, and I say this because uh, there's nothing that frustrates me more than seeing right now so many people talking about business survival and not talking about health. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. You cannot do any of these other four steps if your health is impacted in any way, whether you are, are, are sick potentially from COVID-19 or any other illness, or you have uh, mental health challenges that you need to deal with. So underlying all of this is to prioritize your health. It's more important now than ever, I believe, to make sure that you are healthy and taking those steps to protect your physical health as well as your mental health. So that goes throughout all of these other steps that I've put forward today. Now, a lot of people in the business world don't like to talk about health because it seems like very soft and not serious. Uh, and that's part of the problem in the business world right now, regardless of where we are at today, is that we don't talk about those things. So I wanted to put it out there front and center. Yeah, so Amber, yeah. Amber, if I can just interject quick, I, I totally agree with you. And I, uh, I had a post that went out earlier this week just around that piece. I think that we're in a dangerous period right now where I think initially in the first two or three weeks, People were motivated and they were driven to have regular schedules and to stick with it. And they were excited to try to contribute to their company's uh, opportunities and adaptations. And now a large portion of the labor population is laid off and they don't have those jobs to go to right now. And, and it is easy to fall into bad habits. And, and it's not an overnight thing. It happens gradually. But I am concerned right now if, if, if things are starting to slip right now for people, what is that going to look like in a month? Or two months and, and I don't think that picture um, is trending may perhaps in the right direction if, if we're not really talking about this more more intentionally and, and it is a flaw I believe in the system right now in many ways because as much as I believe that our government is doing an excellent job uh, across the board on uh, municipal levels and, and provincial levels and, and federal level the reality is that if we miss out on this, I think that we're going to have an even bigger crisis than we have right now. And, and part of the issue is that, you know, people have been begging over the past few weeks, is it okay for me to go for a walk? You know, that probably should have been the first piece of messaging that went out, which is, you know what, prioritize your health. If you're healthy, this helps all of us get through this. And that means you can walk and these are the parameters that you must follow in terms of walking safely. Are you allowed to talk to your neighbors? Yes, but you must must be six feet away from your neighbors and make sure that there's distance. But we do believe that relationships are still essential. That language has yet to come out. And I think that's a very danger, dangerous situation to put us all in. So um, 
I'm going to throw that out there. Prioritize health. It's number one. Don't shy away from that. Don't be scared to focus on your health, even if you're trying to run your business at the same time. They go hand in hand. And without your health, you have none of anything I'm going to put here matters one little bit. So um, I know we're going to have some time for questions later on. I just wanted to quickly walk through these steps. And again, I'm speaking about this, not as someone who's coming in like, oh, I have this great framework. You guys should follow it. And I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm a small business owner. I have followed this framework, even though I didn't realize it until I put it on paper. So uh, here we go. So the first is uh, to protect your finances. And I'm going to use strong language here, like prioritize health, protect your finances, because we need this type of language right now to stay safe. That means, of course, all of us are, are staying on top of what cash we have on hand. Uh, for small business owners, expenses are uh, a reality for all of us. Now, the good news is there are lots of ways to cut back some of your, those expenses. Uh, I'll give you an example. So every month at Amber Mac Media, we probably pay out close to $800 in online services that we use to edit videos, to host videos, to share large files, all of these little services that you have signed up for over the past 10 years that you're still paying for. Uh, many of those services have said that they are going to offer free accounts over the next few months to give small businesses some relief. And if they don't, I encourage you to reach out to those companies, and I think this can include even telcos, and say, I need a break. I'm a small business owner. I need you to cut me some slack, and I need a better deal. Even your cable bill at home. I mean, these are areas where we can take a morning and cut back on all those expenses. Those are real things that can help your business. Thinking about the receivables that you have in place from businesses you have contracts with already, the works in progress. Um, and I'm going to put bank support and government support in here. Um, you know, bank support, it's uh, obvious what is available right now. I think many people have talked about that. The government's talked about, uh, of course, the uh, $40,000 loan that is available to small businesses. Uh, if you pay that back by December 31st of uh, uh, 2022, uh, you could potentially get 10,000 of that uh, um, relieved from that full loan. So there are lots of details uh, within the support that's being offered right now by banks and governments that can help small businesses. The wage subsidy, all of these details details are worth digging into. Now, here's the thing. There's a lot of small business owners that are also very proud. And a lot of these small business owners who think, I don't need this. You know, I'm one of those people who believe that I didn't need the wage subsidy. We're actually fine for cash flow. Uh, but we are going to go through that process of actually applying for the wage subsidy. And I'll tell you what. One of the reasons being we've seen a decrease in our monthly revenue uh, beyond 30%. Um, and we don't know what the next few months are going to hold. So it would be idiotic for me not to take advantage of these measures in place. So I'm taking my ego and I'm setting it aside <laughs> and I'm saying, you know what, it's okay to ask for help. So protecting finances. Uh, the next one I'll go through really quickly, which is to nurture relationships. And, and I've put these in an order that I believe is the priority for many small business owners. Uh, first and foremost, your family. Do they understand the situation that you're in? Can they, can they be helpful? Can, can they make sure that you have the time and the space that you need while still nurturing that relationship? your team. One of the first things that I did with our team is to email and say, listen, you're not going to get laid off. Financially, we're in good shape. But what this means today is I need you to step up and I need you to give it as much as you can to make sure that we continue to be able to bring in revenue. And so that was a conversation I had pretty quickly and with full transparency. Uh, conversations with clients. Many people may think, you know, I'm going to wait this out and not get in touch with any of our clients. Now's the time to reach out to those clients and say, hey, I just want you to know that we're here. We're fully operating. We are available to help if that is the case. Uh, and the same for your customers. One of the things I saw early on during this pandemic when it first actually became a reality of this world we were going into is a lot of people stepped back and they didn't say anything. And I believe that was really doing a disservice to your clients, to your team, to your customers, because communication right now is so essential. And the same for your partners and the community that you're in, no matter what type of business that you run, communication is essential. 
Now, the next one is chasing opportunities that do exist. And I talked a little bit about that with the team, whether it's those opportunities for your core business uh, or opportunities for new revenue streams. And this can be through e-commerce. It can be through uh, other methods where you recognize that, hey, there's an opportunity I can make a little bit of money in, in this area. Um, and again, not to be too proud uh, to ignore the fact that maybe it might not be your full fee, uh, but the reality is that we can all use uh, that little bit of extra help right now and we have to seek out these opportunities that do exist. If you have time and energy, uh, I would also say it's an excellent opportunity to invest in your brand. And that can happen through all types of content, creating content on social media, being helpful on social media, uh, training with your team if they want to do online courses right now, encourage them to learn new skills. If there's anything that we've seen right now, I believe that we have seen the fact that the businesses that are going to survive are the businesses that have multiple streams of revenue, and have individuals running those businesses that also have skills that are relevant right now and skills so that they can adapt and change and do different things. Uh, you know, for me personally, as the owner of the business, uh, this means that all the things I used to do where I used to do writing and write articles for a few hundred dollars here and there, that's some of the work that I'm not going to say no to anymore because the reality is it's all revenue for the business that helps the team survive. And the last thing I want to mention is to monitor new realities. And I think this is another area which is especially important is that I tell you all of these things and I talk about bank support and government support, but we've all seen it, particularly around government support, that there are changes every couple of days. You know, some people may see this as a weakness in government. I see this as a strength. I mean, we are adapting very quickly on all levels across this country, which is exactly what we should be doing as we get new information. So pay attention to those regulatory changes, to the market changes, what's happening, uh, stakeholder changes within your organization, even your cash flow changes, uh, and, and also understanding that uh, as, as time goes on, there are new opportunities for your brand and new opportunities for revenue that maybe were ignored in the past. Because if there's anything that I have learned as a small business owner right now, it's that what I thought last week is the not, not the same thing that I'm thinking today. That's how quickly things are moving. I think we're seeing that uh, we shouldn't base our decisions necessarily on information we had two or three weeks ago. We have to go always with that current information. And whether that's government support or opportunities in the digital space, we all always have to be open to new information coming our way. Now, this seems like a lot, but I think if you print this out and you start to check off these different items and understand, have I, have I done this yet? Have I, I connected with my family and said, you know what? I'm under a lot of stress. You know, I'm a small business owner. I have a team that needs to be paid. This is the reality. How can we all work through this together? Have you connected with your team and check off all of these different areas and start to, to put this into play as part of your framework to be able to help your small business survive? I think what we'll all recognize is that there might be more help out there than we initially thought. You know, it, it feels as though we're all alone in this, uh, but the exact opposite is true. Uh, we are all very much together in this pursuit and never has there been a, a time in my life uh, where it has been a, a more equal playing field in the sense that we are all playing on the same field right now. We all have the same challenges. We might have more cash than another person or uh, better opportunities here and there, but at the end of the day, the circumstances are the, are the same. So it's really an opportunity to sit down and figure out what framework is going to help your business um, and not to get too attached to it. And I'll bring this back before I wrap up to Tony Robbins again. If, if you've ever been to any of his events, one of the most useful things that he talks about is how we all get stuck on this blueprint of what our life is supposed to be life. like. Yeah. You know, we all are, we assume right now, and, and, and this is one thing I've had a very easy time just throwing out the window. Like my life is like this now, I don't leave home. <laughs> and that's my reality. But when I was younger, I had, had gotten stuck in this blueprint of what my life was supposed to be like and I couldn't let it go. And so I think for all of us who have this expectation of what it should be like, we need to throw that blueprint out. We need to adopt a new framework for the realities that we're in today. And we need to put our heads down and think creatively about getting things done. And, and also uh, not being too proud to ask for help and to seek out those, those opportunities, whether it's through uh, wage subsidies or government support or financial support, 
or, or even relief from some of the expenses that we have in our businesses to say, hey, you know what? I might be okay, but this is not something that's going to be finished on May 1st. This could potentially be something that lasts for months and months and months. So uh, I think having those honest conversations, I, I think are more essential now than ever. And uh, I know it's just past uh, 1030 your time. So I'll kind of wrap it up right now for any questions, but I encourage people to, uh, you know, have that framework beside you, scratch out what's not relevant to you because not everything will be, uh, but start to, you know, put on your business hat and say, Hey, you know what? I can get through this. I just need to think logically about how I'm going to survive. And uh, with that, I'll throw it back to you guys. Yeah. That, that's great, Amber, and I, I love the uh, the closing analogy around sort of breaking the the chains around the you know the preconceived notions of how we think we have to operate in this new world. Uh, all all bets are off, and anything is is possible uh, within reason. And you know, and I and I love your framework on a, on a number of levels. Number one, it's very simple. It's a very very simple, but ro- but also robust. It covers I think it covers all the areas. But then if you, if you start to dive into the the different aspects of it, there's a lot of work there. And I can immediately see companies rallying their uh, their uh, functional teams around that framework and dividing and conquering and giving some people some immediate purpose and some immediate actions that they can start to schedule on a daily and a weekly basis and then bring that collective intelligence from all of the items on the framework that apply and to the specific company. And, and they can actually start to gather that intel to make some really interesting strategic decisions and fire some experiments and see how they start to land. So it's a wonderful wonderful framework. Uh, Christy, you and, about, you and I have had some, some uh, discussions about the, some of the, the really significant challenge of, challenges about pivoting right now. And I wonder if you might share some of that conversation, because I think it's pretty valid to most of the people that are, uh, that are on the call right now. For sure, yeah. Before I do, I think I might remember, thank you for that framework. I love the simplicity, and as Jeff mentioned, the capability of using it as a rally point to bring your team around. And what I might add for those of you that are business leaders that are, are uh, logged on today is, is that it's important also that you're communicating to the rest of your team, maybe those people that aren't involved in implementing that framework, that you actually have a framework and what you're doing within it, just to let them know that, that you're working on this, that you've got a plan, that you're being proactive. I think it's really important and I think that helps with sort of the apprehension and the sort of mental health challenges that some of our people are dealing with. They, they want to know that their leaders have a plan. And I think that's an easy way to do it. And so Jeff, to your comment, I think um, what I'm hearing with the leaders that I've been working with in the last few weeks is that there's this tension between do we adapt or die? So that's kind of, you know, like a phrase that we hear often, adapt or die or cash is king. Do we preserve cash? Like cash flow is tight. We don't know how long this is going to last. And we, there's sort of the sense, the sense that some are feeling to just sort of hunker down and conserve what they have. And it's a really difficult tension to balance. So I just wonder, Amber, if you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you're, you're totally right. I mean, I, I think we're hearing different, um, pieces of advice from different people and also different projections in terms of how long people expect this to last, right? I mean, how, mm. how, how much does it mess with our heads that we're also living next to a country that in the next couple of weeks is thinking about starting to open up, or at least it looks that way. I mean, there are a lot of things that are, are happening right now that are confusing and uh, that are unpredictable. So um, I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the first piece of advice I would say is that, you know, whether you're managing your finances on your own or you have someone who works with you we have someone who works with us you know it's sitting down and and getting really intimate with your finances because this is something that i've outsourced for a long time and then you know i have to be involved in this now this is not a time to stay away from the nitty-gritty uh details of what's going on in terms of your finances so that's the one thing that i will say i think is is really really important um and and even though uh cash obviously is king during this time one of the things that we're focusing on on i can talk about my own experience, um, honestly, is trying to close deals, is trying to continue to do sales. And it may not be at the level that it used to be, but we are right now giving people opportunities to be involved in digital campaigns that we run. Um, sometimes there's no cost attached to that just because we really want that client. And, and, and mm-hmm. you know, we are in a place where we can afford to do some of that stuff for free right now uh, because I think it's, it's showing goodwill. And, and I do want to mention that because I really, really feel strongly about this. And, and, and I have a, a pretty good memory. Uh, 
I think we're going to remember the people right now who we've gone through this with and the companies and the clients and the leaders and the organizations that have stepped up in a caring and helpful way. And so I, I, I stress that because I think, okay, even if you aren't able to do the sales that you do, is there anything that you can do at a, a small cost or, you know, to make a little bit of money that just shows that goodwill to your clients or your, your customers? Um, so you continue to have a tiny injection of cash or the opportunity in a couple of months to go back to one of those clients that you did a favor for and helped out to say, Hey, uh, you know, can you now, is it possible to pay a little bit more for our services, whatever that might be? I don't think that's out of the question. And I think we're going to see in, in the responses to trying to work through those relationships, again, those people who you want to work with. I've seen it in my business. Um, it, it's so transparent. Uh, you know, the clients that we have long-term relationships with who it's clear we're going to continue to do that in the future, even if, you know, money's tight for everybody right now. Yeah. An, an authentic uh, extension of a helping hand uh, can't be understated, Amber. And the other part of this too is the law of reciprocity is a very, very powerful force. And, and we're certainly seeing a lot of that uh, in, in the world um, right now. I want to get to some of the Q&A now, and if you have a question, a burning question for, uh, for Amber or Christy, please put it in the Q&A section, not the chat box. So we'll look at the bottom <laughs> panel. There is a specific Q&A section, and it's, it's related to what we were just talking about, but Jeff Lobley asks a, a really sobering, all too real question, and it, and it is, why is there an assumption that there's even breathing room to adapt and learn something new? He's finding the opposite. And Jeff, that is a really important question. So um, how, how do we respond to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good point. I, I don't think that um, everybody's going to feel as comfortable maybe in the chaos and feel as though they do have room to to try things and to change, uh, you know, especially, and I don't want to ignore this reality because this is part of my reality too, especially if you have kids at home and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm challenged to do grade five math, which has been a little bit discouraging over the past few weeks, but we have those realities as well. So, um, I, again, I think that that is a reality, uh, but I'll be honest with you. I, I, I have actually had this question come to me many times in the past when I speak about relentless adaptation, even pre pandemic. Um, a lot of people don't have the space to change or to try new things. And uh, this is always a tricky thing for me because I don't know your whole background, Jeff. I just feel it's, it's a necessity right now in many ways. And maybe I feel that way because there are things that before the pandemic started, I wanted to try and I never had time to do. So I'm a real uh, practitioner when it comes to experimenting. I enjoy that process, uh, but I definitely don't want to assume that it's the same for everyone. And if you don't feel as though you have that breathing room to adapt, um, you know, that's, that's, that's your situation. And I totally respect that. Um, I just believe for many businesses, uh, that adaptation is going to have to happen. Uh, and you're going to have to find a little bit of space to do that. I, I can't imagine how any business isn't adapting right now. Christy, what are your thoughts on that? Um, um, yeah, I, I, I agree totally. Um, I think one of the things that we've had a lot of conversation within our leader circles this last couple of weeks is that, and it's coming up in some of the questions that we're getting here is, is how do you, in some cases for some businesses, pivoting and trying to go out into a new market, which is likely a depressed market right now, might not be the right answer for you. Like, it, I think it's very, it's very dependent on your business and what opportunities are there. And I think that we need to give that some consideration. But what I would say is that adaptation doesn't have to look like pivoting and going out after a new market right now. It can be investing in the current relationships uh, like you've talked about, Amber, and investing in really building relationship equity with our current sort of circle of influence so that when things kind of open up again, that we can capture more market share and have deep relationships and then see the return on investment, but a delayed return on investment. And then the last thing I say is, is for some of us, it might make more sense to have our adaptation turned more inwards on our organization. So if you're not going to be pivoting and going out after a new market right now, what can you do with your team to strengthen the foundation of your business so that when you go out again, you're stronger than ever. So can you be, you know, for example, spending time uh, developing your leaders, checking in these webinars for free, and then having a half an hour conversation with them about what their learnings were and how they can apply that to their work. 
um, focusing on systems and processes? What, what are the things on the wish list that you've had that you always have said, if I only had more time, I would fix that or I would do that? Well, well, maybe now those are some of the things that you could be working on so that you can go out stronger when things pick up again. Yeah, yeah, well said. And, and uh, just final comments on this question uh, from Jeff Lobley is back to Amber's framework is lean on community. Uh, mm -hmm. Reach out and do the thing that is hardest uh, is, is ask for help. There are a lot of amazing ideas internally and externally, and there is a ton of inspiration that's being drawn from community. I mean, we have you know over 300 people on, on, on the show today, and, and we get inspiration and from this community ourselves to keep going and trying to figure out ways to be useful. And for everything that's working for us right now, there's five other things that are not, but we only tell you about the things that work. <laughs> but, uh, but it's gonna require a lot of help, and it's gonna require a lot of guidance from people that are, are, are better versed in, in areas than we might be ourselves. Thank you for that, Jeff. Christy, I know you had a question that came up that you wanted to answer. Yeah, uh, so this is from Jeff Garlick, and you, I think, started to speak to it just now, Jeff. But he, Jeff Garlick says, speaking of nerves, how do I manage change and deal with the fear of changing times? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, a, a really great question. And I think that goes back to what I talked about in terms of mental and physical health. And I, I see this as one of the, the biggest priorities. So, um, you know, I think it has to be a few different things. Uh, it sounds so obvious, but even just taking walks at a physical distance, I think is absolutely key. There are so many great apps out there. Uh, Headspace is an example of a meditation app that has made uh, the app entirely for free during COVID-19. So there are many components that used to be paid that you can now try out for just some calm space in your day. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing is getting up a little bit earlier than my family and just spending, you know, even if it's 10 minutes uh, in quiet, because I, I'm feeling with all of us in the house, it's quite loud. Um, so there are little steps that you can take along the way, I think, that that help you um, in terms of that mental and physical piece. Um, there's a, also a workout app that I do want to recommend. It's called Seven Minute Workout. And I've been doing those workouts and I've tried a bunch of apps, but I like this one because it's seven minutes and you can do three of them if you have 21 minutes. Uh, I often don't. Uh, so seven minutes and you don't need any type of exercise equipment. So uh, that, that piece of it, again, I, I think is uh, quite underplayed out there in the world. Um, you know, it's just like stay home, be with your family, which leads to watching Netflix, eating more, not exercising. I mean, we are just set up to have a total mental health uh, crisis on our hands. And, and, and I, I hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not sure if, uh, if, uh, if Jeff was mean to sort of get this, this, uh, this into it, but I have to say, just on a personal level, uh, I wake up usually at four o'clock, like clockwork every morning, and my head is filled with ideas. Mm -hmm. And they seem to sort of make sense to me at my core. And, and then I start to schedule social media around those and different posts and different ideas for our team and things that I think might be helpful to our community. And then by the time sort of eight o'clock or nine o'clock rolls around, I think most of the, those ideas are, are dumb and that people are gonna laugh me off, uh, off of Twitter, but I just do it anyway. And so, and so I think the world loves courage and the world loves authenticity. So whatever it is that's burning a hole inside of you to get out, this is the best time maybe in history to get those things out to the world, uh, not just because the world is more receptive to it now, but because we have these amazing platforms to communicate with. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we don't have to resonate with 6 billion people, just 20,000, <laughs> just 100. <laughs> just just 10 but it starts somewhere and every single person that's on this call right now is something something of value and something unique to offer the world and we want to hear those things and sort of the people that also agree with the way that you view the world uh, they mm -hmm. feel that too and they want to hear those things so um, there's no yeah. there's no magic formula to overcoming uh, sort of courage but if you think of how you're going to help others that might that might also help you Mm -hmm. yeah and i think just to go back because uh, i know jeff garlic a little bit online and and, and i will say Jeff, I think the most important thing is, is for you to know that you're not alone. There are many people, myself included, who have had issues over the years with anxiety. And I was kind of laughing the other day because I was thinking to myself, well, I only had these issues because I was so busy and traveling and going on stages and not getting sleep. And then now I'm home all of a sudden. And even before I do a webinar, I'm getting all my notes and writing out everything like I've never done this before. But I've accepted that as just part of my little crazy process. And, uh, you know, anxiety for me is something that, uh, 
uh, if I'm able to harness it well, I can turn it into intense focus. And I'm okay with that. And I've accepted that that's part of my process. So I just say to Jeff Garlic, the fact that you're even here talking about it is a great thing. Uh, and you're not alone. I mean, everybody's anxious these days. And I think we just have to accept that there's a ways to channel that anxiety a little bit. Um, I do want to just answer uh, as a follow up to Jeff's question just quickly. Another Jeff, Jeff Lobley, who was saying he asked the question about finding room, breathing room to adapt. And he's mentioning that he's an instructor trying to adapt and teach online. The challenges, the adaptations are band-aids at the time, uh, at the moment. How do we move from band-aid to something effective long term? And, and, and I will say, Jeff, that before this, I used to think that online education was a pretty easy uh, nut to crack, so to speak. There were things that could be done well. And what I'm realizing in my own experience with my son who's doing online learning is that it is incredibly challenging. And uh, in many ways, it just does not work that well right now. And there's lots of different uh, solutions to the issue that's just not the same as being in the classroom. So um, I would just say, you know, and I, I used to think, okay, this would be so simple. You know, he gets onto Zoom, his teachers talk to him, but then all of a sudden, you know, he's getting 40, 50 emails a day with different instructions. And then that's inducing anxiety and stress. And, you know, it's not really working. So again, I, I would say to Jeff Lobley is that uh, I, I think it's these tiny little tweaks and if you don't have room to make a massive change in that instruction every day, you know, getting a little bit of feedback and then doing a slight pivot instead of a, a pretty uh, severe pivot can be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Amber. We're getting a ton of great questions right now on the Q&A line. And I want to just tell everybody, if we don't have a chance to get to all, your, all of your questions, we want to answer every single one of them. And you can do that by emailing them to us at info at unleashresults.com. So info at unleashresults.com. Send those questions to us if we don't get to them. So Patrick McCubrey has another question, uh, and I'm sure others are feeling. Uh, with being in survival mode right now, um, where would we suggest a good starting point to invest the very limited resources that are available for new offerings and opportunities? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's what many people are facing right now is that maybe you don't have that same amount of time or to, to borrow what Jeff Lobley just says, just that space to do anything that is too dramatic. Um, I don't know if uh, you would be comfortable just giving us a little more background about your business because I, I, I sort of hate to answer things in a general way when we don't know exactly uh, what your business is. Do you, do you guys know Jeff or Christy? Well, yeah, actually I know Patrick's out of, out of Kelowna. Their business is headquartered in Vancouver Meeting Max. They're a software platform that helps uh, consolidate uh, for uh, large-scale events like Tony Robbins, as an example, uh, okay. uh, uh, hotel and accommodation bookings. Oh, interesting. So yeah, so that, you know, that that's kind of, I think, uh, an example of uh, a business right now that I would imagine uh, is uh, going to be affected for potentially many months to come, but it doesn't mean that you can't participate in any type of change that's happening. And, and to be honest with you, and maybe this is my own bias coming through, but because I, I do love social media and content creation so much, if you were going to invest in a, a, a minimal amount of uh, a minimal amount of your time time and energy from your team. Um, I honestly think it's starting to create relationships on your social channels and just tell people what you're going through and, and what the team is working on, uh, generating content, coming up with ideas. I mean, that's that's hard to measure as far as how that's going to help you in the long run. Uh, but let, in 2020, we can't underestimate the power of having a very intact and strong and tight-knit social community. So if you've never had time to work on that, I think now is a, a great time if you can devote even just a little bit of space to that. Yeah, no, that's good. I, something that we've seen our clients use through the years has been trying to figure, okay, what are your core competencies and what are the adjacent marketplaces that they also serve? For example, like we, had, uh, we, had, we, uh, we work with a camp business called Red Rock Camps. In 2014, they were the fastest growing company in Alberta. 2015 they were not <laughs> and so they had to they had to figure out where else can we find business and so they could take their camp expertise and they applied it to uh to the firefighting uh, industry and and uh and uh, forest fires in particular and that was enough to keep them running not enough to get them the fast growth status anymore but enough to keep them running and operating so they could figure out a new normal uh, and uh, so that that worked for them as well uh christy i know you have a question you want to get to there's so many good questions. Wow, it's really hard to pick which one. Um, there's an anonymous attendee that asked, she said, our business 
is in constant triage with clients in distress every single day and it's emotionally exhausting. People can have limited tolerance for learning when they are stressed. What are some best practices for teams to plan innovation and training into their schedule every day intentionally? Uh, I mean, I think that's a, a great question. And, and I would uh, probably recommend that before planning innovation and training into the schedule every day, uh, dealing with the mental health piece of this is probably even more important. Um, I'll give you an example. A company that I know uh, recently gave all of their staff a subscription to Calm, which is a, a meditation app and helps with mindfulness. And that was a way to address this issue without being you know, too heavy handed. Um, so I think, you know, bringing the team together to say, hey, you know, this is obviously stressful for every, everyone. I just, again, I don't want to um, sound soft on the business expertise that I'm bringing to the table, but I honestly believe that we cannot even talk about innovation and training and all these things if, if we don't get on the same page with mental and physical health. So uh, that would be the first thing that I would address. And then, you know, start to, maybe you have uh, Zoom chats that start to bring the team together and say, listen, the sky's the limit. Uh, we are having a brainstorming session. What are all the things you wanted to do felt like you couldn't do? Like the world's insane right now. Let's focus on that. Like there are ways to allow people to have space to be creative. I think right now that we've not really had before, uh, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to anything tangible right away. Yeah, a couple other thoughts I, I, I have on that question, Christy, would be, even, even though it might, just, it, it might just be very, very minimal, highlight progress that has been made, authentic, mm -hmm. genuine progress, but just highlight any type of, of, of little progress and small wins that you can. And there's no substitute for connection one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, people are, everyone's feeling this. And we have to reach out individually with phone calls and FaceTime and Zoom chats, just one-on-one -on -one to have specific, unique conversations to try to create that psychological safety that we've been trying to create in the workplace when we can get together. And you know, obviously now that now we can't. And, and we have to rely on leaders to, to have mandated time to get together with their teams as well and do fun things. Like Friday afternoons, we've launched a Zoom saloon for our team and then for the greater community. So we do 30 minutes just with our team to catch up and see how everyone is doing and talk about progress for the week and successes and failures. And then we invite the world to join us uh, for, uh, for an hour and a half to just uh, have, a, have a glass of water or a glass of wine and talk about what's happening in their world. And we're finding amazing feedback just from connecting people all around the country that uh, have never even met before in some cases. Yeah, I'll, I'll, add, I'll just add a couple small process things to give consideration to. So, uh, for example, when I facilitate my leader circles, that, that's a, you know, eight to 10 leaders coming together to talk about their business challenges. I start the meetings by giving them each two minutes and they're to share what's going great and what the struggle is personally and what's going great and what their struggle is professionally yeah. or at work. And it's not with the intent of talking about each other's problems and struggles necessarily. It's just to hold space for each other's challenges and to give people an opportunity to first of all self-reflect and then express that. And when they can kind of dump that and then we can get into conversation and we can put some of that behind us. And then another really, really quick and easy way to do that is to, is if you're having a team meeting to potentially just ask everybody to take a second to reflect and then to share three words that describe where they're at emotionally right now, just a three word check-in, that's it. Go through each person. And then again, it just kind of sets the stage and allows you to move into the other work. That's terrific, Christy. Um, I'm just typing some answers into the chat because I realize that uh, we may not get to them, uh, yeah. all of them. So I just didn't want people to uh, feel like it, um, feel as though they weren't getting uh, acknowledged. Uh, uh, Jackie says, "What is the name of the exercise app again?" I'll, I'll type it in. It's called Seven Minute Workout. It's it's there's various levels of uh, intensity, but it's just a really great free app that I've started to use. Um, and someone's asking me what I'm drinking. This, <laughs> this is not, it looks like Tang and I'm old enough to remember Tang. It's, <laughs> it's not, it's uh, one of those emergency drinks that uh, has, uh, I don't know, a thousand milligrams of vitamin C in it. And I just drink one every day. I don't know. It's maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. <laughs> it makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah. Whether it does or it doesn't. Yeah. That's all. So what you think it does is all that counts. Eh? Do yeah. we have do we have one time for one more question? We have, we have time for a rapid fire. We have 60 seconds to answer okay. one last question. And just remind people, if we didn't get to your question, send them to info at unleashresults.com. We promise we will get back to them. 
as long as they're uh, all above board and, and goal oriented. Okay, now we have 30 seconds. So this is a, this is a trend. Um, is there a risk that discounting your services or products will create a new market price when this is over? Several people ask questions like this. Uh, yeah, so that is a really great question. And uh, I will say, because we have done a little bit of that, and, and uh, I've always been fairly good at pricing because I've always communicated uh, what the price is and uh, what the price I'm going to give to you right now is. <laughs> and so um, I, I'm being clear about that because I think if you say, okay, you know, normally uh, I charge uh, $150 an hour, but right now um, it's $30 an hour and I'm going to be giving you that rate for the next few weeks till we get out of that it shouldn't be unclear to the people that you're giving that rate to that uh, the price is going to go back up. So um, that that is not a fear of mine. To be honest with you, I think I have a, a strong uh, threshold for um, for risk in many ways. So I, I it doesn't feel risky to me. I feel, I've always felt if you communicate specifically with people and you're you're honest and transparent that you can get through uh, a lot of these situations uh, and and there'll be no misunderstanding. It's when people have phone conversations and they're not really clear. I always follow up an email and say, okay, just to clarify, this is what we talked about so that you have a record of that. And my dad's a, a little, uh, I don't want to say litigious, that's not the right word, uh, but has always taught me to have very specific details and records of everything. So as a business owner, I think that's really important right now. No misunderstandings. Yeah, absolutely. And you can consider packing in even more value to your existing mm -hmm. group of paying customers and, uh, and then offering some versions and variations with time horizons to Amber's point. That's working well for us right now is we're offering 45 day programs that uh, do not in any way, shape or form uh, uh, compete or cannibalize with our core offerings. That, um, that the majority of our, um, of our customers are on right now. Sure. And, and don't be afraid to try to get work. You know, I've had clients who've said to me, listen, we're not doing anything until June. And then I've said, well, let's talk about June right now. What, what, you know, I know it seems far away, but let's start to plan for June. And we've actually got into some of that planning because I don't want June to come and this is still happening. And then I have nothing going on in June. So, so I, I don't think you should be afraid to ask for what you need and to plan a little bit further ahead. It feels yeah. like, I mean, at this, the last thing I'm going to say, because I know we have to go, is that at the same time you feel as though uh, I've got to be alert and conscious of what's happening every single hour because it's changing so quickly, but you also can't forget the long term. It will get back to some sense of normal. Yeah, absolutely. Amber and Christy, thank you so much. I, I wish we had another two hours, and I'm sure uh, the majority of the audience does as well. So some reminders as we go. When you log off, we really, really want your feedback. So don't just close your screen, please click on the continue button that you'll find near the bottom and provide us with all of your feedback. It's gonna help us create uh, uh, different iterations of this to continue to provide value in your living room every Thursday at 10 a.m. Mountain. Stay connected with us through the email address, of course. Please visit Amber Mac's website at ambermac.com. She has an amazing newsletter that she sends out. It is absolutely packed with value. I can't wait to read that when it, when it gets into my email in the morning. Uh, we're also offering complimentary, anybody that was on the workshop today, 60-minute innovation portfolio planning workshop. So if you're stuck, if you need help, if you want us to help save you some time, we'll get your team together and we will help you do that and get some semblance of structure so you can begin to take some actions for your own business. And again, don't forget to fill out the survey. And then on to next week, uh, we have got Allison for Gale. Some of you on the call are maybe familiar with her. Uh, Allison is a research workplace psychologist from the University of North Carolina, lives in Chicago. She's a Steelers fan, uh, don't hold that against her. But we're gonna be talking about negotiation and not just regular negotiation, but how is negotiation different in the time of crisis? What happens when a customer phones you and wants to cancel their bill or doesn't wanna pay their invoice? What happens if you have to phone a vendor? You wanna negotiate with your bank. How are you gonna get better outcomes? Well, we're going to tell you next Thursday. So I hope you can join us. The recording of today will be on the YouTube channel. Can't, can't, uh, can't wait to see uh, everybody back here again next Thursday and interact with you on the social channels in the interim. Thank you very, very much.